Welcome to the Palestine Church audio podcast. We hope you enjoy this message by Pastor James Warren. For more great content and updates from Palestine Church, please visit us at palestinechurch.com. We're going to spend some time in the Word this morning. I'd love for you to open up your Bibles to two passages, uh, Galatians chapter 5 and uh, John, put a marker in John chapter 16, I believe that that is where we are going to go this morning. While you're turning there, I'll make you aware of uh, something we've been in a series of talks over the past, uh, I don't know how long, four or five weeks, just uh, pursuing this question, what in the world is God doing? And it's just, uh, the Lord's been speaking to me and several others about this, and I, I hope that you're asking the Lord that same question. It's important for us to understand what God's doing in different seasons uh, because um, when we understand what he's doing, we can understand what we're supposed to be doing in that season. This is a crazy year, but this is a good year. You probably don't hear that enough. This is a good year. This year will go down in history as a, a unique year. Um, the books will write of so many different things that happened in our nation. Hallelujah. <laughs> um, but I wonder what the books in heaven will write about the believers that lived during this time. I wonder what the history books will say about the people of faith who walked on the earth in 2020. And I feel like we're in this place, we're at this precipice where we've been invited into this, this moment. God knew that we would be here alive in 2020. He knew that you'd be in Palestine. He knew that you'd be here at this church. He knew that you'd be surrounded with the people that you're surrounded with. And he put you there and trusted you with this year, with this season. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, that you trust us. One of the things that um, I feel that the Lord has been doing in this season, he's been doing it for me, he's been doing it with a lot of people around me, I believe he's been doing it in our church, is that the Lord has been exposing things. We see that in the world, that the Lord is exposing darkness. He's bringing things that were hidden in society into the light. He's bringing things that have laid uh, beneath the surface of our country and our nation that, that uh, are coming to the surface right now and they are coming into the light. Now, as a believer, um, we are not afraid of exposure. Uh, the psalmist uh, wrote in Psalms 139, he starts off his psalm with, Lord, you've searched me, you've known me, you've seen, you've examined my life. And then he goes through this beautiful psalm where he talks about the intimacy and just how known he is by God, that God knows him. He knows you when you stand up, sit down. He knows the thoughts, the very thoughts that you're about to think and the words that you're about to say. God knows you that intimately. And David ends the psalm with this, O oh Lord, search me. Know my heart. One of the lessons that we've learned in that several weeks ago is that exposure to the believer is different than exposure to those in the world because the exposure to a believer is something that we embrace and we say, God, you are going to do something good out of this. So when the Lord begins to draw near to, to our lives in a, in a season of light shining in our lives and in our hearts, our position, our posture should be one that embraces the exposure that God brings into our lives. We should embrace the light that he brings into our lives. Jesus promised us, and we'll see this verse later, that, that the Holy Spirit would come. Jesus had to go and he gives us the spirit and the spirit of truth will lead us into all truth. How many of you want to be led into truth? You want to walk in the truth. You want to walk in the light. There's nothing more disheartening than realizing that you've been walking in darkness. But there's nothing more joyful than realizing that you've come into the light. And God is so faithful to us to bring us into the light. And I want to do, take a moment just to do a little review of last week's sermon. We're talking about how God is exposing why. 
exposing why and exposing our motives that God cares so deeply for us that he shines his light into the very desires of our heart. In Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, writer of Hebrews says, The word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of the soul and the spirit, of the joints and the marrow, and the discerning of the thoughts and the intentions or the motives of the heart. Verse 13, it says, And no creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. That the word of God, when it shines into our lives, when it shines into our hearts, it literally does surgery in our lives. All the way down to our motives. And it begins to expose the why we do what we do. It begins to expose our desires. We looked last week at the, the difference between our lives being under the old covenant and our lives being in this new covenant and the prophet Ezekiel prophesied that when, when, when we're in this new covenant, that God will put his spirit within you and cause you to walk in his statutes. The prophet Jeremiah said the same thing, basically. That this new covenant with the Lord is, is not determined by our actions, our outward appearance, our outward pursuit of righteousness, but that the righteousness of God would be put inside of us. That the spirit of God would come into the life of every believer. And from from the place, from our internal place with the Spirit, our spirit would begin to want to obey the Lord. Now, I believe this is so important because um, really when you look at the story of the... Can we turn this down just a little bit? It's just a little loud for me. When you look at the story of the Israelites, uh, you you go through the Old Testament, there's, there's a constant, um, the Lord would give them commands. He would give them statutes. He would give them laws and they would follow those laws. And as they followed those laws, they would be blessed. They would prosper. They would grow in the land that the Lord had placed them in. But for whatever reason, they would get comfortable. Um, they would get complacent. They would begin to break those laws. They would begin to uh, their actions and their, their, their disobedience to the law of God would begin to get back to God, if you will. Not like he didn't know it, but it would get back to him. And then God would raise up a prophet to come to the children of Israel to speak to them and, and, and tell them, you are getting off base. And there's this pattern you see. There's, there's uh, the children of Israel walking in his promises. Then they get away from his, his statutes, his his, uh, his law that he's giving them. And then all of a sudden God raises up a prophet and the prophet comes, he speaks to the king, he speaks to the, the children of Israel and says, repent, turn, stop doing these, these actions that you were doing and come back to the Lord. And if they did come back to the Lord, guess what? The blessing, the prosperity, all of these things would begin to flow again in their lives. And if they didn't, things would get worse for the children of Israel. So there's this, there's this law that we see that if people would follow it and, and, and they would live by it, that there, there's blessing and prosperity. But that's under an old covenant. When Jesus came, there's this new covenant that is, enters into the equation and actually enters into the heart of us right here this morning, that we are not waiting for our actions to get so out there, so lawless, before, this, before a prophet, God raises up a prophet to tell us that our actions are wrong, but that his spirit lives within us. And that we can, if you will, course correct at every moment with the spirit of God living in us. Why does this matter? Because for many of us, the church that we grew up in, the church that we know is a church that condemns our sin and condemns our actions and and judges our actions. But many times we don't know how to overcome or change these actions because we've never allowed the Holy Spirit to come in and do an inward transformation in our lives. And so the church, I said this last week, but the church gets guilty of working towards behavior management instead of Holy Spirit transformation that comes from the inside out. Now, as a body, this is what we're after. We want to see you. I'm not here to just tell you the law, the rules of life. 
The book is here. You, there, there's so many things that you can read that will teach you how to succeed in life. But we're here to preach what the Word of God says and to give to you what the Holy Spirit puts burning in our hearts because the Spirit of God lives inside of you as well. And He will convict you and He will teach you everything that you need to know. When we live this way, here's some good news for the churchgoers. The church leaders no longer have to worry about trying to control people. I'll go on record saying, we have no desire to control you. We have no desire to, to manipulate you or try to get you to do what we need you to do for our mission and for our vision. That should be liberating for some of you. Instead, church leadership looks like we trust that the Spirit of God, the same Spirit that's in me, lives inside of you, and He Himself, God, the one who created you and knows you, is working in your lives. So you don't have to be intimidated to come to church. You say, I don't know, I don't know a lot. I don't know exactly what I'm supposed to do or how to fit into this crowd. Don't worry about that. The Spirit of God will lead you in everything. And He's not going to lead you to fit into this crowd. He's going to lead you to Jesus. Amen. So that's why God cares about our motives. <laughs> that's a long way to go around to say that God cares about our motives. He cares about why we do what we do. Um, now, there is another layer beneath that. The what of life, the what of our um, actions, our behavior. The why speaks to our desires and our motives. Um, but I'd like to even go a little bit deeper this morning to talk about who you are and how the Spirit works in your life to remind you who you are. I've titled today's sermon, Exposing Who. Last week was Exposing Why, this is Exposing Who. So God knows our every motive. He knows our every desire. Then why is, this, why is there a need for us to interact with the Spirit of God in our lives? If he knows who we are, he knows what we're going to do. He knows, uh, as Psalms 139 says, he knows when we sit up, when we rise, the words that are going to come out of our mouth. He knows us so intimately. And every human being is naked before God. Then why must we seek first the kingdom of God? Well, as was prayed earlier, and it is our mandate of how to pray, that we pray for the kingdom of God to come on earth as it is in heaven. Because the reason we pursue this is so that we can step into kingdom reality. See, just because something is promised by God does not mean it's our reality here on earth. And God has trusted us this time on the earth to walk and to pursue him so that his reality becomes the reality that we walk in. And so when we do that in our, in our thoughts and in our desires, we begin to see transformation in our lives and our hearts because our heart, our desires, our, our actions, all of that begins to come into alignment with his kingdom purposes. And this is what repentance really is. You know, in our stream, or, or the way I saw it growing up, is like repentance meant somebody ran down to the altar and screamed. <laughs> ah! And then... That's genuine repentance. And I'm not saying that that's, that can't be a form of repentance or, or maybe that was repentance going on in that person's heart. But I remember as a child being frustrated in seeing people run to the altar, but their lives never change. And can I tell you something? The world is very frustrated with all the people who come to the church, but never change. <laughs> You know, because we claim that God is all powerful, this, this present being that is working. He can do miracles, He can do signs and wonders, and He can do all these amazing things. But then we go out and we live no different than the world, and people wonder, what kind of God are you talking about? Because I don't see the evidence of Him in your life. God doesn't want that. You don't want that. So what we do is we pursue the kingdom reality in our lives. So we must step into the light. And when we step into his light, he reveals to us who we are, who he is, and who we are in him. And this is the place where a repentance, genuine repentance can occur. The changing of the way that we think. Now, in this season, 
I've alluded to this, that there is uh, an intense amount of pressure that's being put on our lives. Just right, once again, show of hands, how many of you believe there's a lot of pressure going on in the world today in your life? The pressure on the outside that we see, the pressure that we see in the news, on our Facebook feed, it's an external pressure, but really pressure comes from the inside. I like to think of it this way. Our family owns an air conditioning business. When we hook up a, a new air conditioning unit, one of the things that we do is we, we put pressure in the lines to test the lines because we want to make sure that there's no leaks. An air conditioning unit is a closed system that, that Freon runs through the lines, and we don't want leaks because then we have to come back and, and put more Freon in your unit. And that's just free advice for all of you. That's air conditioning advice. If your unit's leaking, you've got a problem, okay? Like, <laughs> there you go. No, I'm not plugging any companies up here. So we put this pressure in there because uh, we want to see if there are any leaks. And it's called a pressure test. And this pressure reveals to us the integrity of the pipes. It reveals to us the integrity of our welds that we've done. Now, in a season of pressure that God has allowed the pressure of life and the pressure inside of you to heighten, it's the same thing that's happening. The pressure that's within you, when you see it coming out in bad actions or bad behavior, that's a signal to you. That's a clue to you that there's something going on on the inside that you're not able to handle. And when you hear a leak, when you see a problem, when you see a, a, an action or something on the outside that's, that's out of order, you know it's out of order. What we do so many times is we say, well, that's bad. And that's where we leave it. Instead of embracing the process with God that says, Holy Spirit, show me why we're doing that. Show me why I'm acting this way. Are you with me? Okay, so we're in this season of pressure. Ultimately, I believe that as believers, what we should be leaning into is the Spirit of God. Truthfully, we should always be leaning into Him. But there are times when we, we get weak, we get frustrated, and we want to draw away from Him. And I want to encourage you in this. This is not the season to draw back from the Lord. This is the season to lean in. Amen. To lean into what he's doing. And I tell you, it's, it's painful sometimes. But God is doing something beautiful in your life if you allow him. So like the psalmist said, Oh Lord, search my heart. This is this great verse that reveals to us our need for the spirit and the activity of the spirit in our lives. The Apostle Paul said it like this in Galatians chapter 5. Verse 16, he says, But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other. To keep you from doing the things you want to do. But if you are led by the Spirit, verse 18, you are not under the law. Can I get an amen for that? <laughs> if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now, the works of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, uh, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, Fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warned you as I warned you before that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Let's pause for a moment here and let's, let's examine this list here. Now as I'm reading that list, probably most of you looked at the big ones. Or you looked at the ones that you hide or that you hate. One of those stood out to you. But I do want to make a point that he says, and things like these, as to point to this is not an all-inclusive list. The Apostle Paul is saying that the works of the flesh look like this. All of these things, strife, fits of anger, rivalries, and everything in between, those are all the works of the flesh. And he's warned them before, 
These people who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, you may have heard this preached like those are the people who don't go to heaven. Has anyone ever heard it that way? If you do those things, you don't go to heaven. All right. What Paul is actually saying is that if you do those things, you won't walk into the, in the reality of the kingdom of God. You won't walk in the fullness of what God has created you for. Okay? So let's just take that off the table. And really, I mean, you can put this in the context of this scripture. He's not saying you're not going to heaven. He's saying if you walk, walk in these things, the kingdom of God is not going to be real and active in your life. But, verse 22, the fruit of the Spirit... Y'all ready? Is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things, there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Verse 25. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. The Spirit. I love the illustration that Paul uses here about the fruit of the Spirit. Let's just take one brief moment to examine fruit. Fruit is the evidence of nature's process. It's the evidence of nature's uh, response to the elements, the, the healthy elements that are around it. Fruit is not a tree. Fruit is not even uh, the substance of the tree, but it is the evidence that the tree is partaking in the substance of the earth. Are you with me? So the fruit of the spirit is not supposed to be like, there's these different, like the spirits, like there's a spirit of love, spirit of joy. It's supposed to be the byproduct of life with the spirit in your life. That, that the fruit of the spirit is it's actually just fruit. It's just the fruit. It's just one fruit. It's just the fruit of the Spirit. When you live with the Spirit, life with the Spirit, and you engage in the elements, the, na- the elements that God has put in your life, and you are uh, living in that, partaking of that, letting it flow through your life, the fruit that will hang off of your life is love, joy, peace, patience, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I'll say gentleness because that's the one I always forget. My wife's like, you always forget that. And I'm not gentle. So it's like, oh, okay, yeah. I don't know why. I don't know why I forget that. So what life by the Spirit produces these, this fruit that hangs off of our life. Let's just imagine yourself as a tree. That's easier for some of you to do because you love trees. Imagine yourself and imagine the fruit that just hangs off of your life. And imagine the purpose of fruit, uh, you know, for people to enjoy, for people to partake, for people to take that off of your life. God has created you and I to be fruit bearers. He's created us to actually have something hanging off of your life that you can give to the people around you. However, the fruit is not what we're striving for. The fruit is just the byproduct of the relationship with the Holy Spirit. (laughs) So, in the same illustration that we used last week and that we're using this morning about our actions, our what, examining our what, we must be careful as well not to examine our what. See, see, because we looked at this last week with the motives. Like, you can do ministry and have wrong motives. You can preach the gospel and have wrong motives. You can do a lot of good what's and have wrong motives. But we must focus on the roots, which is the relationship with the Spirit of God inside of us. So yes, your actions matter, your behaviors matter, but we use our actions, our behaviors, the things that are hanging off of our lives as markers, as, as indicators of what's actually going on on the inside. Does this make sense? So... Paul, and and we need to put this in context, Paul is talking to some believers who had received the the good news of the gospel and the spirit, and they are walking in the spirit, but now they've gone back to some legalism, some religion, believing in their flesh and and their their ability to to walk in righteousness outside of the covenant that was made by God. 
And he's calling him back to that. He says, listen, you can't live by the law. You can't, you can't fulfill the law. There's no way that you can do it. But through Christ Jesus, he has put his spirit inside of us. So why try to live, uh, tr- why try to attain righteousness through your actions, through your behaviors, when you can live righteously through a transformation of your heart? By living by the spirit. And Paul finishes this paragraph with this. If we live by the spirit, we also have to keep in step with the spirit. So what does this look like? It looks like you uh, examining your fruit. Yes. Don't strive for fruit, but strive for a relationship with the Holy Spirit. Don't get so focused on your fruit. Focus on your roots. And allow the Holy Spirit to engage and to search every portion of your heart and of your life. Do not settle for uh, condemning, condemnation on your actions. The Holy Spirit comes to bring conviction, not condemnation. Now, there's a judgment. Like our actions are judged. Here's the thing. I I gotta get this right so we can understand it. I can't, we can't sit up here and say, well, your actions don't matter. You can just go out and commit any crime. You're just being led by the Spirit. It's just not true. The, the Spirit won't produce that, as we see. But people could take this out of context and say, well, I, my actions, pastor said, my actions don't matter. I'm not worried about managing my behavior. But your actions will be judged. If you go out and commit crimes, they'll be judged by our society. They'll be judged by the people around you. They'll be judged by our legal system. Your actions will be judged. God's purpose was not to take away judgment. He was taking the external judgment and making it an internal judgment. (laughs) The spirit is on the inside and he's convicting us on the inside of our hearts and our lives. If we can embrace the conviction of the Holy Spirit here, we'll never have problems with our actions and our behavior. Okay, we, we will have problems every once in a while because we'll forget who we are. And I'll get to that here in just a second. But the fruit is the evidence. Too many times I've been guilty of just allowing shame and condemnation to keep me focused on the behavior modifications and the actions and the sin that's the outward stuff and not leaning into the goodness of God and the Holy Spirit that's working on the inside. And that's where the transformation comes from. I'm running out of time. So this is John 16. Are you ready? (laughs) You don't have to, you don't have to turn there. I've only got a few minutes. Jesus says, it's to your advantage that I go away. Because when I go, the helper's coming. And the the Holy Spirit will convict you of the world concerning sin, righteousness, and judgment. Concerning sin, because they do not believe in me. Concerning righteousness, because I go to the Father and you will see me no more. Verse 11, concerning judgment, because the ruler of this world is judged. I ran out of time to to get this the way I want it, but here's what I want to say. The Holy Spirit is in your life to produce Christ-like character in your life. We did a teaching, uh, Pastor Bill Byers did it, in our I think it's in our Kingdom Living series, it's on YouTube. It is an excellent teaching on the work of the Holy Spirit in a believer's life. And how he is there to mold you, to shape you, to take the elements that God has placed in your life and to build Christ-like character in you. And he convicts us, he convicts us of sin. Not, I want to read it again, concerning sin, because they do not believe in me. We, we don't spend enough time in the church talking about how Sin is, is really just the deception. How we are deceived and not seeing God clearly for who he is. He wants you to see Jesus clearly. He wants to convict you about righteousness. Now, that sounds scary, but here's what righteousness is. Jesus has gone to the Father, which means he's 
made you righteous, not through your works, but through his. And then he wants to convict you of this, that the ruler of the world has been judged. And that's judgment. The Holy Spirit's working in your life to convict, same, we get the same word from here, convince you of Jesus and who he is in your life. Who he is in the Father and that you're in him. And, and he's just, he's working in your life to convince you of who you are in Christ Jesus. Why wouldn't we allow the Holy Spirit to do that in our lives? Why are we so afraid to allow him to cut down to the deepest parts of our soul and our heart to show us who we really are in Christ Jesus? Fear, shame, religion, sin, so many things. I can go on. They keep you from allowing the Lord to cut you deeply. But as the psalmist said, search me, Lord. But wait, he already said, you've searched me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because when you realize that you're seen and known by God, that we are all naked before him, that there's actually not a thought, there's not a, not a motive that he doesn't know about you. When you realize that he actually sees everything that's going on in your mind and he still loves you and he still chooses you, that's when repentance happens in your life. All of a sudden, you can be transformed because you know what? I am broken. I am messed up. I am flawed. And God sees it. And he sees all these negative things in me. Yet, he chooses me. And he loves me through his son, Jesus. And when we allow that revelation to come into our hearts, the Holy Spirit begins to do a transformation. Would you stand with me?